Many people say that WrestleMania 19 is one of their favourite ever shows, and last time out, I gave it a quite favourable review. I think you'll agree, but will the follow-up show be any good? Let's find out on another episode of 10 Years Ago. gentlemen and welcome to this. This is another episode of 10 years ago, my favourite series of all the vids that I make. Tonight we're going to be looking at Backlash 2003, another show that joins the ever-growing list of shows that I only ever seen once. So on the night, didn't watch it again. This is another one of those shows. So before we get on to this one, we're going to talk about the storylines that got us to the show during the matches themselves. There's just one thing that we should probably talk about, something I probably actually should really have mentioned on the last bit, and that is that WrestleMania 19 drew a woeful, for considering it's WrestleMania, 560,000 buys, which is way, way below what they were expecting it to pull with such main events as Hulk Hogan versus Vince McMahon. Uh, WrestleMania draws in excess of a million by rates these days. You know, you can see why they were very, very disappointed with such a low figure. But anyway, should we get on with this? So in the opening contest, Team Angle defeated Los Guerreros in an all right match to retain the SmackDown Tag Team titles. So I could talk about this match here. And it's, it's two and a half, three star match, a decent match. Nothing that you wouldn't see on a decent episode of SmackDown around, you know, the 2003, 2002, you know, the SmackDown 6 time, you know, decent SmackDown main event, this was. I, I want to talk about, I want to talk about something else, because the talking point for me of this one is that the Team Angle brought down a picture of their team captain, Kurt Angle, of course, was out getting neck surgery after, you know, after he, 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 he his last match was the, the main event of WrestleMania 19, what have we seen again for a couple of months, when and had a, a new surgery procedure where they, instead of fusing his neck, they just cleaned up the bone spurs around it, which took like six months, maybe even longer than that, off, maybe even eight months, you know, off his recovery time, so of course he wasn't out, he was out, he wasn't here, he was out, out, out injured, and Team Angle brought with them to the ring a picture of their team captain, now, Wrestling 101 decrees that if you bring a prop like that to the ring, it's getting smashed over someone's head. There's also a separate rule regarding this one in the whole Wrestling 101, which is the whole birthday cake rule. But that's another rule for another vid. Now, another point I'm trying to make here is that all four men in this ring are great athletes, very talented, but all four men... All four of them break the rules because the the picture does not get smashed over anyone's head. Let's tell you about that. I can tell you about the finish. Um, as Chavo goes for a back suplex that Charlie Haas counters, Benjamin holds the legs down as Haas covers him to get to the three. And here comes the smashing. Me thinks, no, smashing doesn't come. Team Angle celebrate next to the picture, and um, that enables Chavo to hit a nice tope onto them. But the picture doesn't break. Then he has a chance with the pitcher again. Doesn't take it because Los Guerreros steal the championship belt. Goes to the back, bounce up and down in a uh, one of their souped up cars, whatever. And Team Angle look distraught, but are comforted in the fact they've still got the pitcher. That's just weird. It's all good fun. Believe me, I'm just taking the piss here. But it's just, yeah, a match that's I really, I, you know, I get complaints genuinely about, oh, why are you saying that? You're taking the piss. Like, yeah, I am. That's the whole point. Yeah, this, the, you're, you start watching the whole match going, that's going to get smashed over someone's head. As soon as they come out, you're like, that's getting smashed over someone's head. When it doesn't get smashed over someone's head, and I get it, right? Trust me, before you say anything, I get it. It eventually does get smashed over someone's head. I get that. I was just want, I wanted to see it here, and I was disappointed. Good way to open the show, though. It was a decent, it was a decent match. It was the best. In fact, I, I'd go as far as to say, because on, based on my star ratings, it's the best match of the night. Genuinely. So, in the back, we see Test forcing himself on Tori, which is uncomfortable. Um, she leaves, and then we see Sable watch her go. Now, Sable is an interesting case. One of the hottest and most popular divas of the Attitude Era. Um, she left in 1999 when she filed a sexual harassment suit with the you know, in the courts against the WF and said that the WWF was an unsafe working practice. She um, sued for millions and millions of dollars, 
until the WF countersued her and said, well, if you're going to do that, yeah, fine, whatever. It's, it's an unsafe from work environment, but you're not using the fucking Sable name outside of, outside of um, the WF. At which point, of course, Sable must have realised that there's nothing that she knew because who the fuck is Rena Mirror? You know? It's like China. You know, China couldn't use the China name, and what she done is significant since she left the WF. It's exactly like that. So she accepted out of, out of court an out of court settlement, turned up on Nitro one time, sat in the front row, which is lovely, and then went and got on with her life. And so, you know, basically swore that she wouldn't ever work in the WF again. So I'm guessing that in the year, the four years that have passed, that it's become a safe working environment or something like that. Or, of course, what it really is, and that's that money talks, <laughs> isn't it? Yes, yes it is. There's a theory that I've heard many, quite a few times regarding the WWE, and that's that if you have made money for Vince, it doesn't matter what you've done in your past. Whatever it was that you got fired for, if you've made Vince money, he figures that you're making money again. And seeing as all he gives a shit about in life is making money, you can go back, look at Hogan, for example, look at Piper, look at, you know, on this show. Piper had sworn that he'd never work for the WWE ever again. But here, it's still like, like a month before WrestleMania, but here he is, he's on this pay-per-view. Fucking yes. Next, Sean O'Hare defeating Rikishi in an absolutely rubbish match. Sean O'Hare was one of WCW's hot properties. He? he was a three-time tag team champion team in twice with... Sorry, I've got, got to check my notes on this one so I don't get told off for getting it wrong. Twice with Mark Jindrak, once with Chuck Palombo. Other than having the sweet swan Tom bomb, though, I don't really remember anything about him because i'm sure you people can understand that i've tried to erase all of the wcw pay views from that time from my mind i never want to see him again brought into the wf as it was at the time as part of the alliance he was one of these more you know, can't miss sort of things but then he um well he got ass, his ass whipped by the apa at Invasion, one of the guys was told that he couldn't work. So he was sent to OBW for over a year before making his main roster call-up. And he spent six months on 2002 jobbing on Velocity. You probably noticed in my 10 years ago series last, last year, I didn't make, mention him once. But then they gave him a gimmick that was absolutely fucking brilliant. It was a devil's advocate gimmick. He talked about cheating on your wife and eating what you wanted and not going to church on a Sunday. Why? Because you want to. And it was fucking brilliant. It ended with a catchphrase that people still still talk about to this day, still remember, which of course is, exactly, exactly, I'm not telling you something you don't already know, absolutely brilliant, there's one problem, one tiny little problem, and that's that, um, that's that Sean O'Hare had never been particularly good on the mic, and couldn't cut the promos that he'd been doing in these vignettes in front of a live audience, so what did they do, the geniuses that they are, they gave him Rowdy Roddy Piper, Good work. Good work. So the problem with that is that straight away, all the heat and all the focus went from being on Sean O'Hare and this fantastic character to being on Roddy Roddy Piper. And what that meant in turn is that Sean O'Hare went from being the devil's advocate to being just another big man. And it's like, oh, oh, never mind. You know, just like that. To really, really properly nail it in the coffin, though. <laughs> to really properly nail it in, in the coffin. They did two things which I just to this day don't understand. Sean, as I mentioned, was quite the quite a good flyer. He could move around the ring well. So to so to differentiate him from everyone else there, they didn't do anything. He just became a generic big man. He did all the same sort of moves that every other generic big man did. And then speaking of generic, the final nail in the coffin, the final like shut down this, no one's getting out of this, is they gave him generic rock Eight is his theme music, which is just woeful. Let me tell you something, without even looking down here, this match was wank. There was nothing of note whatsoever. In fact, no, actually, no, I tell a lie there, because the whole point of this match, let me just remind you before we go on, is that the whole point of this match is that Rikishi wanted revenge on Rowdy Roddy Piper because Rikishi is Jimmy Superfly Snooker's um, cousin. So he wanted revenge on Piper for hitting him with the coconut in 1982. Or whenever it was, please don't get at me for when I'm forgetting it wrong if I was. So the only high point in this match is that Rowdy Roddy Piper had a coconut shattered over his head. And my God, that busted him open, if you can believe that. A coconut that's obviously a fake coconut because of the way it shatters in his hand. And 
yeah, that makes him bleed. Widow's, wi sorry, I was going to say Widow's Peak. Um, Widowmaker gets the win for Sean O'Hare. Lovely. In the back, Sable Rats tore out to Stacey and Rob Van Dam says he's worried because Chief Morley is refing his and Kane's match, which is next. Kane says it's going to be fine. So it's all good. RVD and Kane then defeated the Dudley Boys in a boring as sin match to retain the Raw version of the tag team titles. This match was bad because it gave us King and Coach on commentary. I'm having a brain fail because I've completely forgotten to write down why Jim Ross wasn't there. Enlighten me. Please just check the comments, please. I don't want 25 comments saying this is why Jim Ross wasn't there. Just check if someone's put it already. Don't bother commenting. Happy days. Um, I do, I've said before already, Dudley boys were as stale as they could be at the moment. They added Chief Morley to the mix as guest referee. Still didn't give a flying fuck about this match. The match, sloppy, botchy, and boring. They botch an Irish whip in this match. An Irish whip reversal spot is botch. Morley goes low on Kane, which gets Bubba too. He goes to charge at RVD, but hits Bubba by mistake. Devon pulls him for a bit. Lance Storm comes charging out. He gets owned in quick time. A 3D for Morley, who rolls out of the ring. Chokes on for Bubba, and a frog splash gets the win as a second race referee sprints to the ring. One, two, three. Sounds exciting, doesn't it? Wasn't. It was overbooked, and it was boring as Hell. And, uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's the, those are two words that don't really go together very often, are they? Overbooked, boring. But this one, trust me, it was. <laughs> Meanwhile, Stacy confronts Tori about Test, and they brawl in the women's locker room. It looks awful. It must be lame for the girls like Victoria and Molly, who are just... Their, their paycheck for this show is to sit in the dressing room. I suppose on one thing, it's a lot and a very easy way to make money, and it's sure as hell easier than getting beaten the shit out of in the ring. But you know one thing that make I mean, really really is weird on this one is that ivory's there and she's in a towel and you're like why you haven't had a match and we checked right i put this on facebook we checked there wasn't, there wasn't well, she wasn't in a dark match or anything so just in the middle of the show the show she thought yeah that match was one i'm going for a shower <laughs> so when she comes back <laughs> when you when you're in you cut to this thing she's in a towel she's just got out of the shower why the fuck not? Why the fuck not? Next up, Jazz defeating Trish Stratus in an, an alright, actually, match um, to win the Women's Championship, meaning that Trish Stratus got a really long reign as the Women's Championship there. She'd been attacked at Women's Champion, not Championship, you know what I mean. She'd been attacked by the Dudleys, Trish, this is, and Jazz on the Raw six days earlier, so it came to, she came out, she was selling the ribs really nicely. She did a pose, you know, the way how she used to do that. Yeah, she sold the, she, she sold the ribs, so that was really good. Um, she did a gr uh, great looking good range suplex. Didn't see that coming. Trish tried to run in the corner. Jazz turned it into a single leg crab. Bit off, but it's still really good and it works on the ribs. Really nice, that. Teddy Long threw in one of his shoes at Trish Stratus. Who throws a shoe, honestly? Jazz carries a sunset flip, holds on to the ribs. You get three. I say it every single month. I seem to, I seem to say it every time. A million, billion, gazillion times better than what you would see in the WWE Divas division now. Two stars, though. You know, not great, not brilliant, better than anything to say. And then we go about some shit because the big show defeating Rey Mysterio and in our second dud of the night, I gave Sean O'Hare Rikishi a dud in case you haven't looked down below. The second dud of the evening. Ray had embarrassed the big show for three weeks leading up to this match. This was a match that no one cared about. And wow, we this was a squash. Don't get me wrong, Rey Mysterio got offense in. He got three 619s in, for example. Problem is, big slow. Sold none of them. Sold none of the offense. Sold none of it at all. Yes, sir. He got the choke slam to get the win at three forty-five. So I just, I mean, I just do not understand this much. One bit. You take one of your, you, your, your most popular and rising guys in Rey Mysterio. Cause think about it, he's only not even a year into his run in the WWE at this point. Excuse me. And you just utterly bury him. I mean, complete. Lee bury him. Now, bear in mind, the whole point of this match is to set up the stretcher match with Bork Laser a month later at Judgment Day, yeah? But that we know for the benefit of hindsight. At this moment in time, this is just Rey Mysterio getting owned for no reason. And think about it, it wasn't just, you know, it wasn't just an owning because Rey does a stretcher job off a choke slam, making it look, look like an utter, utter chump, yeah? Big Show comes back out. Gets the, gets the stretcher and swings it into the ring post, which means that Rey Mysterio, because he's tied down, falls 
forehead first onto the ground. He takes all the brunt of the impact on his forehead. That can't be fun. Do excuse me, I have my jaws clicking. I can actually feel my jaw clicking here. That's a bit strange. Um, the whole point, yeah, is we know, like I say, from hindsight, this was to set up a match the following month. I get that, right? What I don't get is why sacrifice Ray and why bury his finisher and why do this on pay-per-view? Why couldn't they have done this? If they have to do this, why not do it on SmackDown? You know, the show that establishes the match for the pay-per-views. Don't use a pay-per-view to sell another pay-per-view because that makes you feel stupid for even buying it in the first place. Does it not? Next up. Awful. Um, the bat in the back, Ric Flair, Triple H, and Jericho got a promo about basically how great they are. Tori and Stacy continue fighting in one of the uh, corridors until Test, uh, the fighting about Test, sorry, until of all people, that, that that great man, Scott Steiner, makes the save, making his first appearance on pay per view in two months because of course he wasn't at WrestleMania. And then Test comes out and freaks out. And basically, basically let me tell you this, yeah. All these promos and all these segments are all terrible. I just woeful get off my screen sort of television. So proper of its worst. Brock Lesnar then defeated John Cena in a mm, match. Cena won a tournament to become the number one contender. He beat Eddie Guerrero. He beat The Undertaker. Now I have to express, he beat The Undertaker when the FBI came out and attacked The Undertaker, not just on his own merits, and then beat Chris Benoit in the finals. He cut to rap at the start, John Cena, about... Former WWE champion. It's mildly entertaining for about a minute. How's that one sound? Um, boring chance early on. Show what the fans think about this one. I think the problem is this with this match, right, is that John Cena is nowhere near ready for a, a main event match, let alone a main event push or a championship win. So you're watching this going, yeah, but I know Cena's not going to win. And that's not the benefit of hindsight, looking back at it. It's just a straight up, yeah, but Cena's not going to win this match. He's not a main eventer. He's not even an upper mid-carder at the moment. He's a lower mid-card guy. Um, no, just absolutely not. Not a chance. No, thank you very much. Brock Lesnar had been busted open on the SmackDown before this pay-per-view, so uh, he had a big cut over his head when that got cut, ripped off. The cut opened up and he started bleeding again, so there's plenty of claret in this one. I'm not going to take that away from it. Saying, <sighs> Lesnar looked his, awful, or, or, his awesome usual self, throwing Cena around like he weighs absolutely nothing. Cena, to his credit, tries. It's just that he... And you know, the thing is, he, he, he does moves that I'd forgotten that he does. Just really nice flipping neck breaker that's genuinely good. The problem is that he botches so much and missed time spots all over the place. So it's one step forward, two step backs with John Cena with this one. And also, I'm sorry if you feel like I'm ripping on this one a bit too much, but <laughs> this match is way too long. Over 15 minutes long, when you could have cut five minutes off this match comfortably doing exactly the same thing in the same time frame and come away with exactly the same match way 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 too long properly overexposed both men in my opinion goodness me Cena gets his chain goes to use it but the referee stops him and that allows Brock Lesnar to hit the F5 for the win back to the mid card with you though Cena no main events for you for a long long time no title shots either and then, in the match that I know you've all been waiting to see as Triple H, Chris Jericho, and Ric Flair defeated Booker T, Shawn Michaels, and Kevin Nash. <laughs> so, this match gets absolutely no build-up package whatsoever. Nothing. The opening package of the show focused on the uh, Bill Goldberg versus Rock match. So this one, you've just got to guess why it's happening, I'm guessing. So, uh, I'll run it down for you. Um, Goldberg returned the night after WrestleMania, as I'm sure you all know. A week later on Raw, Kevin Nash returned in the middle of a match which was Shawn Michaels and the Hurricane versus Ric Flair. I'm sorry, which is Chris Jericho and Triple H. Every, you know, both Shawn Michaels and Triple H were really ecstatic the fact that Kevin Nash had returned. They must have seen something that I don't know. And... Um, <laughs> Excuse me, have to do at least one a bit. I've been resisting it the whole way as well. I need, knew I needed to do it. And I'm sat there going, Bobby will tell me off for this one. But I must must not do this. Anyway, um, yeah. Um, but Triple H and Shawn Michaels were feuding, as we know. So they were both happy, but they were, uh, you know, obviously Kerry Nash can't be mates with both of them. So a week later, Triple H came out and said, uh, choose one or the other. 
one or the other arms, choose one or the other, and then Triple H, because he's a heel, went, ah, oh, I'll make the choice for you, and whacked him with a sledgehammer. So there we go. Happy days! Shawn Michaels is feuding with Jericho, Booker T is feuding with Triple H. There's two feuds, put them together. Happy days. We've got a six man tag, and it's one of those, well, why not, to be honest? So. Let's go through this one, shall we? The only one, the only match of the night I'm going to actually go through word for word because I need you, I need you to see because it's time, folks. It's time. When was the last time we got to play everyone's favourite game? It's a game that I get derided for, but fuck that. I enjoy playing it. Play along with me if you like. It's the game called <laughs> How Many Bumps Will Kevin Nash Take in a Six Man Tag Match, no less. <laughs> so. Come on, let's go through it. Let's go through it. Nash gets very good reaction when he comes out, which is just plain sad. He has, but he's getting Nash for God's sake. The old Diesel gets nothing. Jericho and Shawn Michaels trip star. They give us a nice pinfall reversal sequence before Michaels tags in Nash. Hooray! He batters Jericho for a bit more trip before Triple H distracts him, enabling Jericho to get one whole punch in before he takes the big boot. In comes Booker T, who gets two off from Flapjack. Jericho playing the heel in peril there, by those things. He just got bounced around from pillar to post. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Sorry. I read my notes like a couple of lines ahead and make myself chuckle because I know what's coming. <laughs> in comes Triple H, who quickly gets it. Sorry, I'm sorry. It's too far. Come on, professional. Professionalism. Come on. <laughs> I love this shit. I fucking love it. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'll try. I'll genuinely try. You ready? <laughs> if you could see my notes, you'd be laughing. I swear you'd be laughing. <laughs> stop it. Stop it now. Come on. Stop it. I'm not even going to edit this bit out either. I'm just going to it, leave it in. I'm going to open the window. Bit of cold air. Come on. <sighs> Ready? In comes Triple H, who quickly gets into his stride by hitting a quad ripping spy buster of doom! Ah! You see? Do you see? He then tags in Flair, who misses his very first offensive move, an elbow drop. In comes Michaels, who backdrops Flair, then launches Jericho over the top, and Atomic drops Triple H. Switching music for Ric Flair, but Triple H hits a pedigree to make the save. That's a bit excessive, isn't it? Nash sends Triple H running while the referee gets up to six. Um, sorry, Nash sends Triple H. Yeah, Nash sends Triple H running while the referee gets up to six. Flair tags in Jericho, who beats on Sh Sh Shawn Michaels for a moment, and then tags in Triple H, who also beats on Shawn Michaels, including a flying knee that gets two. Flair in, he goes for a figure four, but it's cradled for two. Flair, incidentally, no selling the effects of the switching music that he took two minutes earlier. Just no sells, you know, not even a twitch of the jaw or anything, but you know, never mind. Why would he? Triple H in, he works the leg of Triple H, of a, he works Triple H in, works the leg of Triple H. That makes sense. Triple H in, works the leg of Shawn Michaels. Flair in, he does the same. Nash gets the hot tag to silence. Genuinely, it's a hot tag. No reaction. He cleans house. Seriously, guys, honestly, go back and watch this one. There is no reaction for the hot tag whatsoever. He has a snake eyes and a side slam on Triple H. Flair punches him a few times and then begs. Walks into a Booker T punch, which gets a bigger pop than anything Nash has done in this match. Genuinely, pedigree attempt is countered. He sets up a jack, you know, Shawn Michaels, no, no, it's not, it's Kevin Nash, sorry, sets up the jackknife on, tri on Triple H, but Jericho hits him with a missile drop kick, and there's one, ladies and gentlemen, one bump. Does that even count as a bump? He takes a missile, not drop kick, it's not like he's getting slammed or anything, but we're going to say it's one because he left his feet. Oh, hell yes. Acting from Booker T to Jericho and a super kick for Flair. Spinner Rooney is followed by three brawls breaking out Booker and Jericho on the outside. Nash and Triple H on the aisle, while Shawn Michaels and Ric Flair go at it in the ring. Jericho in and Bulldog Shawn Michaels, a figure four and a leg alliance all at the same time is just evil. Oh, now I've lost my place because I'm a moron. And Jericho says, come on, come on, come on. It's two moves being done at the same time. It says at the same time. Walls of Jericho for Shawn Michaels while Nash sets up a smack on the table. But then he decides, I don't want to, I don't want to trash the table. Fuck it, I'm getting back in the ring. <laughs> Genuinely. <laughs> the ref gets bumped in such a terribly bad way. It's such a contrived sort of way. Jericho is in the jackknife position. Kevin Nash has got him. And Ric Flair comes over to him, and Kevin Nash grabs him by the throat, and then they sat there and they sort of scoot round, because of course Nash has got Jericho in between his legs, and then yeah, so it swivels round, and then pushes Flair 
into the referee, gets knocked to the outside. Triple H spotting that the referee's been knocked to the outside, goes and gets his trusty phallic sledgehammer. And, um, yeah, while that's happening, uh, Jackknife power one for Jericho. And um, he, Jack, Triple H, comes in with the sledgehammer and nails Kevin Nash. And that's do. Oh, hell yeah. And uh, the thing is, Patrick's down. Um, oh, my God, the crowd just don't give a shit at all. They just don't care. The guy, this is going to be the guy who's challenging for your heavyweight championship for the next two months, has just been attacked and hit with the plate of sledgehammer by the number one heel, and there's no reaction, nothing at all. And that gets the win. Patrick recovers in time. That's why I got confused. I thought I saw Patrick. I'm like, what the fuck have I written there? Yeah, he hits him with the sledgehammer. Nick Patrick miraculously wakes up and gets, counts to three. Now, I know I take the piss out of Kevin Nash for, taking his, you know, for not taking many bumps. I understand that. And, of course, I am just joking. He took two bumps and lost to a weapon shot. Explain this one to me. How does that make me think to myself, I really want to see him versus Triple H for the belt. Now, answer me this. Honestly, anyone watching this, did you think to yourself, I am going to put my hard-earned money down now because I really want to see Triple H versus Kevin Nash. Something I should have mentioned at the start of this match is that gone commentary coach like these two used to be the best of friends but i've gone back and looked and i genuinely can't find anything apart from the curtain call where they were acknowledged as mates on screen so you've just got to sort of the wwe are just assuming that you knew about the click backstage which is just plain stupidity what i can't even remember what rating i give this match what was this one? One star because i'm nice wasn't very good crowd didn't give a flying fuck in any way shape or form and, um, well, neither does, to be honest, apart from counting how many bumps Kevin Nash took. He took two, which is probably a record in the WWE, isn't it? So, in the main event, Goldberg defeating The Rock. And this match was a dud. Ha <laughs> ha another one. They ran a video for Goldberg at WrestleMania, as you are all aware. And, um, yeah, he got quite a good reaction. And then the next night, Rock's in the middle of the ring, cutting a promo, saying he's done it all. He's done it all. He's beaten everyone. And now, he's done. And at that exact moment, Goldberg came out and Rock got speared. When he went, you know, after, after, of course, the line, who do you want to know who's next? You're next! Now, the thing with this is, WWE did, really shot themselves in the foot here because they didn't do any promos, or many promos, I don't remember seeing any, promoting Goldberg for what he was back in the day. You know, they don't they didn't, they didn't show anything about the streak, for example. They do on the start of this you know, this show, the video package for it, has got the streak on it, but they mention nothing about him being a champion, of WCW, they mentioned nothing about the feuds he had or the people he beat. They just assume that you know who he is. That's a bit daft. <laughs> the build up to this one was really good, I thought, other than one little moment, of course, which wasn't focused, they didn't show it on the video package, but it's Gold Dust putting a blonde wig on Goldberg. Hilarity in short, no, it didn't. But the but yeah, the build up package was fantastic because of The Rock. His facial expressions were just wonderful, were just fun. Fantastic. So there are many, there are quite a few points going into this one. Why it's a dud? Because then you may you may remember this match being good and thinking to yourself, "Wow, that was actually a really good match." What the fuck are you talking about, Pearson? Let's talk about this one. First things first. Far too long. It was thirteen minutes, right? Goldberg's matches in WCW were always short, explosive, to the point. He gets in, kicks ass, he leaves. He wins, he leaves. That's that. He shouldn't be going this long. Secondly, Rock stalls way too much. Goldberg looks like an utter chump having to sit there while Rock stalls. I understand before anyone says that the character of The Rock is scared of Goldberg. I get that. But there was too much stalling. A bit of stalling wouldn't have been a problem. It's too fucking much. Oh, God, yes. Thirdly, the fans are clearly, and obviously this one makes perfect sense, pro WWE. This guy has been, you know, think about it, I've said this before, WWE fans have been taught and trained for years, and, well, worse, they right, taught and trained for years, that WCW was rubbish. So we've got this guy, this outsider, this invader, if you will, who we should cheer him because of what exactly? Rock is out there being entertaining, so we cheer him. The fans, that's exactly what they do. Fourth, the commentators make so little mention of WCW, it's just not even funny. They did, like I said a moment ago, don't mention the streak, don't mention the title win, don't mention anything. Why should I care, as a casual viewer who's watching Goldberg, potentially for the very first time, 
why should I care about this guy that I've heard bits about, but I don't actually know that much about him? No? Ah. Oh. Lastly, lastly, Goldberg gets so little offense in, you wouldn't believe it. Show how many moves he gets in. If you count the spear, because he hits three of them as one move, yeah, he hits four moves, if you can believe that shit. Four moves. He has to sell for feckin' ages. Absolutely ages as well. For example, he goes for a spear and runs into the ring post, right, and he lands up on the outside and sells for ages. My God, he lays down for a people's elbow, for goodness sake. It's just, no. He gets a, that's the thing. Rock gets a two count off the people's elbow. Goldberg, this ass whooping machine, gets spine busted and people's elbow. And he does the whole thing. It's not like he do. He just spine busters him, does the that. When he bounces off the rope, Will Goldberg kips up and spears him into oblivion like everyone wants to see, surely. No, he has to lie down and take it. Three spears it takes, and then the jackhammer get the win. The crowd, incidentally, by this point, though, had utterly turned on him. Goldberg sucks chance for their new babyface hero. And that, folks, is why this match is a straight-up dud. This show is one match and one match only. You, you, you tuned in to see Goldberg versus The Rock. You'll watch it back to see the opening contest. There's two two-star matches out there. The rest of it is utterly, utterly forgettable drivel with three, count them, three dud matches. Incidentally, with those three dud matches, if you don't agree, I genuinely would like you to go and watch the matches back and tell me why. I'm going to go right now because I A, I've been waffling for too long and B, we haven't had a single emergency service vehicle come past me and that, ladies and gentlemen, has got to be a record. This pay-per-view, what, Three out of me, two? Two out of ten, I think we're going to give it. It's utterly shit in every way. You watch the opening contest if you can find it. Every other match just avoid like the plague. And I was going to say, unless I want to see how many bumps Kevin Nash takes. But you already know that, don't you? Ladies and gentlemen, this has been ten years ago. The next, op next one in the series is obviously Judgment Day 2003, which features Kevin Nash versus Triple H. Yeah, we'll look forward to that one. Let me know what you thought in the comments. I don't reply to them all, but I read every single one of them. Hit that subscribe button if you haven't. If you're new to my videos, I really hope you enjoy this one. I love this series so very much. Hit that like button. I will see you all very soon. Take it easy, guys, and peace. Bye-bye. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this. This is another episode of 10 Years Ago, and tonight we're going to be looking at Backlash 2003, 2003, we can edit that out so we can do it again, fucking superb, brilliant, <laughs> let's do that shit again, oh yes. <laughs>